Welcome to the Schofield Truth. I'm Susan Schofield here with my daughter, Jannie, and Hello. my husband, Corey Cabana. Hi. And you may remember from episode four that my daughter was taken by DCFS from her school, Valencia High School, and put in a lockdown facility called Maryvale. She tried to get back to me, but the reality is if I had taken her back at that time, I would have been charged with child abduction. Now, this also happened to um, our special guest, Misa, who's going to be coming on later. And she was charged with child abduction after her kids were begging her to come get them. DCFS overreached their power. And this brings harm to so many people. This is not just our family. It's not just Misa's family. This is happening all over the country. And we're talking specifically in L.A. County. But before we get to all that, we're going to go to Jannie's Jeopardy. All right, let's go. Number one, a personal essay where social workers diagnose a situation to obtain a court order to remove children from their homes. Uh, what is a petition? That is correct. A petition. Well, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, a petition is basically what a social worker believes. Um, they have limited knowledge of a situation. They're not an expert. They don't even have to talk to experts. They can talk to friends, family, just people on the street. And, they, and everything that they do is based on a preponderance of evidence. A preponderance of evidence is the lowest level of evidence uh, requirements for legal statutes. It's he said, she said, everybody says, so it must be true. But a lot of times it's just not. And that's supposed to all come out in the court hearing, but it doesn't. So anyway, what's the uh, next one? Number two, when children are forced to, into a stranger's car and are taken to an undisclosed location. What is state-sponsored kidnapping? That is correct. That's right. What? Tell us about that, Corey. What is state-sponsored kidnapping? Well, it's very easy. It's when the state thinks that there's a problem, and so they've offer, authorized a agency to detain a child. And, yeah. you know, the problem is, is that the laws aren't being followed. That's the main issue. If a agency that is working for the government doesn't follow the laws, what are we to do? Because laws must be followed because we have due process in this country. The only thing that, that the government owes you is due process. Without due process, then we don't have a, an agreed upon playing field that we're operating on. So due process is vital and dependency court and uh, the child protective services, it appears that they are violating due process rights of parents across the country on a daily basis. So that's something that needs to be approached and resolved fast. All right, Jenny, what is number three? All right. The ex, the ex had parental rights terminated in family court, but somehow reinstated in dependency court and brought back into the children's lives. What is the non-offender? That's yeah. right, the non-offender. Um, coming up in... Um, our case uh, talking with Misa in her ex-husband actually was um, charged with physical child abuse. His rights were terminated in family court because of this. There was evidence. That's why his rights were terminated. But DCFS comes along and decides that He's the non-offender in this case. And what happens? Well, they brought him back because they wanted someone to be opposed to the mother. Because, you know, you got to have a parent that's for something and against something. And so DCFS will side with whatever side that, you know, works for them. And if it's a non-offender who's had his parental rights terminated, DCFS will bring them back and say, look, the father is here and he wants his rights. It's really happening. This is really, really happening. Yes, it, it's unbelievable, but it's happening. Coming up, we're going to invite our guest, Misa, to be on the show, and she's going to explain how all of this happened to her and how she is facing criminal charges for felony child abduction. That's all coming up, but first, take a look at this video that kind of sets it all off. Thank 
kid down here in the plane. Huh? How are you? Hi, how are you? Can you just like yeah, can you just okay. put my recorder on? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Can you go ahead? Welcome back to the Schofield Truth. I'm Susan Schofield here with my husband, Corey Cabana, Hello. and our good friend, Misa. And she's going to tell us about her experience with DCFS and how it led to um, a charge of uh, felony child abduction of her own kids. So, Misa, can you get us started? How did this start? How was the beginning of this? Um, what do you say from when the social workers first got involved that led to the child abduction? Well, first of all, actually, I want to go back a bit because you were involved in a domestic violence yes, that's uh, correct. situation. So first, tell us about that. What happened with your ex? So, I mean, I've been going through domestic violence since 2012, and I already escaped um, prior to DCFS encounters. What had happened is I started a Facebook page to go and help other victims of domestic violence to go ahead and escape because it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I contacted um, the county department for for aid, anything that I could possibly so get. So you went to them for help? Yes, I did. Prior to their involvement, I asked for help. I have emails with them. Um, I, I said I need help with getting childcare established uh, because we escaped. We left our home. I had a large 3,000 square foot home and I had no choice but to leave. You Be were in Texas? No, I was in California. Okay. It was actually San Bernardino County. Okay. And I did get a restraining order September 2020. However, three different sheriffs allowed my ex to violate the restraining order, which forced me to have to leave my own home with my children. Okay, so DCFS first gets involved then. No, no, not then. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I already had a past experience with DCFS, which made me very afraid to right. have any kind of future contact. Despite my fear, because I wasn't able to get any other kind of support, I even, I was so desperate that I at least attempted to reach out to DCFS. Um, I was looking for housing assistance. I was looking for childcare assistance so I can get back into work. Right. Um, and I got a response back stating that because I don't have a case, they can't help. <laughs> okay, so now, you get away from your ex-husband. Yes, that's so correct. So you're free. You have, uh, you're with your mom at this time? Um, or? No, I mean, I was, at first I was with my dad for a little while. Okay. Um, and, well, actually, sorry, I was in hotels. I was able to support myself for a little while until mm -hmm. I wasn't able to. Um, I had just lost my job recently due to my double disability. All of this happened at once. September 2020, everything just blew beyond control. Right. Um, so I was with my dad afterwards, and then I was with my mom, and then my friend Sam said he can go ahead and help us out. So we were um, kind of between places during right. that time. Um, but that's why I reached out to DCFS, asking for housing, asking for child care services, everything that could have prevented their um, involvement on June 2nd, 2021, which is when everything became in their turf. Okay, so then bring us now to that night, that day that this all came to be? So on that day, I was having a medical emergency, which is what I told police officers and what I told to social workers. And there's police involvement with the West Covina Police Department. However, that's another <laughs> league of its own. Um, yeah. But what had happened is the social worker falsely stated that the children were residing with me and their father, while knowing, in fact, that their father wasn't we hadn't seen him for the past nine months. Um, they discovered that he was in Texas while we were in California. That's where I got Texas from. Okay. <laughs> yes. So um, he was not anywhere in the picture. There was multiple statements that um, aligned with this. But despite those facts, a social worker stated that the children were residing with me and their father in a domestic violence situation, mm -hmm. and therefore they needed to be removed. Wow. All right, so now we just saw a video of the police entering your home. Yes. Tell us what happened before that. Um, so prior to that, um, I had gone to um, 
Different police departments asking to take down a criminal report because the social workers falsified judicial records to remove my children. Um, so I, they were in state custody yes. on, and they were staying with your mother at that point. Yes, they, okay. they were. Um, so when the video that we saw, that was December 11th, 2020. So it's about six months after the children were initially removed. Um, so given that time amount, I didn't just take my children. Right. Uh, I, know. I contacted um, LAPD, um, two different LA county sheriff's departments, um, one being Duarte, the other one in um, Palmdale. I also contacted El Monte Police Department. And not only that, I also contacted Whittier Police Department prior to everything happening. And I stated I wanted to make a criminal report. The officers refused to take down this report. I even emailed everything over showing, look, these are the California laws. There's laws that are codified that shows police officers can return children back to the lawful custodian, that lawful custodian being me. And it all started with a lie, a social worker who assumed or no, no, just flat out lied. He mm. knew in fact that um, their father wasn't anywhere near them. I had told them, my children all told them individually while they're by themselves, my you, mother. You gotta understand what happens here is social workers are actually getting bonus money for placing children. So the incentive is actually to remove the kids versus trying to help families keep their kids together. But I also want to let everyone know that not all social workers know about that bonus. That's the, the Federal uh, Family Act of 1996. There's a, a incentive where the social workers get money to take the children. They get more money to place the children. Then they get more money to adopt the children out. But that's yeah. only if they know how to file the paperwork and the ones who know how to do it aren't sharing. So now they, uh, they come to your home. And now before they actually get to your home, your kids who, who, were reaching sorry, out who, to you. Who came to my home? Oh, the police my officers. Oh, oh, yes, the police officers. Right. Yes. Before all of that happened, um, you were called by your kids to come get come get them. They did they understand anything about what was going on here? They had an extent. However, the all the social workers continue to tell me and the children we can't talk about the case. Yes. Um, which is very common in every single case. I know with you, Susan, yes. you had a gag order placed on you immediately after you told social workers that if they removed your children without a reasonable basis, that you would go ahead and make this public, yep. that you would file a lawsuit. And the first thing they did was file a gag order against you. I know in my own case that didn't happen. Really? No, it didn't. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. I had social workers who were complaining that I can't record what's going on. And the judge stated that I can't say anything bad about the social workers. I mean, I'm just explaining the truth and the facts of what's going on in this case, but I'm not saying anything bad. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's quite something uh, what is happening here. And again, this is across the nation. This is not just L.A. County, but we're talking specifically about L.A. County because that is where we reside and that is where we've been filing lawsuits against them continually. So, uh, Misa, tell us more about that night when you took the kids. Yes. Um, so on that night, um, like I had mentioned, uh, November 20th, I went to the Whittier Police Department before I took my children on December 11th. Um, and so at that point, they were on, on the new day when the police officer came over, they were willing to look over my documents because now I had the kids and it wasn't where it was a social worker. When, it was, when the tables were turned, then they were willing to look at my documents. Um, but the officer stated that, and his name was Officer Jaxi, um, he stated that he was going to go back to um, the police department to go and look over the records that I provided. However, him and his team were actually orchestrating a scheme to come to my home directly instead. As you saw in the video, um, they just try to, the police officers just try to enter my home. That's right. And I, and I want to get to that too, because they're entering your home, but do they have a warrant? No, they did not. They didn't have a warrant. Um, and actually, uh, you were there present. Mm -hmm. You and Corey, you were present there at the hearing where yeah. uh, the officer hooped, I think her name was, uh, hooped, mm -hmm. I think that's how you pronounce how it. Yeah. Specific. How Housh. Yeah, they were how having a hard time at the <laughs> hearing. Um, how hooped. I think it's H-O-U-P-T or something. Yeah, so, I think you're right. Actually. So you guys saw her mm -hmm. testify yeah. that the officers did a knock. Right. She was a horrible witness. No, I have never seen a witness so bad. It's like she couldn't 
didn't remember anything. She had spent three hours sitting outside the courtroom, and why didn't she, re, you know, reread the report? She couldn't answer a single question that either attorney asked without. Can I look at the report? I know it. It. it um, <laughs> in fact, the prosecuting attorney, she to me looked like she was drunk. I mean, I don't know. She had all of her papers everywhere. She's like, yeah, I think that happened. Uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Not not very good. No, it's like they get money for the court date. So a lot of people think that you're getting justice when you go into a courtroom, that now you get to present your evidence. It doesn't work that way, actually. Um, you are at the mercy of what the prosecuting attorney, or that's in criminal court, and then in um, dependency court, it's the DCFS counsel says, and they accept that as truth. Then you have your public defender that can, you know, is kind of shy there and will make a little statement here and there. But um, mostly, I mean, in criminal court, it seems to be better. We're going through this right now with Misa and her entire case. But in dependency court, they literally work against you because they want to be part of the team. Everybody's, you know, part of the team. And the court is who they, that's their boss. The judge is the boss. All of that's why I call it the Edelman Courthouse players. Well, because no, remember they're the, all just playing for the court. They and the all court makes money. They all work for the same judge. Okay, the the person sitting to their right and sitting to their left is the same person who will be there the next day, the next week, because regardless of the case, it is the same people sitting in in front of the same judge. And it's also the same script. So basically, everybody comes in. And it's like, I explain it kind of like um, a bad version of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, where now you're coming in and it's the same show. You know, you're in the audience and you are, you're now invited up and you're throwing stuff or whatever, but you're now invited up to this show that's already happening in front of you. And it's, um, well, you know what? Well, I mean, my court appointed <laughs> attorney, his yeah. name is Marcellus Glasper. Okay. Um, he specifically stated to me in a text message that I don't have any constitutional rights inside of the juvenile court. Yeah. He was so comfortable with even stating that in a text message. Um, so, I mean, how can we expect any of these other attorneys that are in the juvenile courts to go and do anything? In your case, mm -hmm. your court appointed attorney... Um, Which one? Ooh, hold on. <laughs> the Veron's first one. The latest. Oh, the first Laura one. Served her. What's her name? Manky. Laura Mankey. Yes. yes, Laura yes, Mankey. Laura Mankey. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So in your case, she waived your rights without yes. notice, without information, and without your consent. Actually, she waived it after being told that we wanted the social worker to be on the stand to be cross-examined. And when that opportunity came, she just let it die on the floor because the judge asked one question. He said, does your client... Uh, waive the reading of the petition, advisement of rights, and enter a plea. And she goes, yes, Your Honor, general denial plea. And that was it. That that's, was it. that's where due process rights died, right there on the floor. And every single person, the judge and every single lawyer that was sitting next to that, you know, uh, at that table, every single one of them violated their oath of office. Right there. And this okay. is happening again all over. Now, well, I want to talk about oath of office. There are serious consequences to violating your oath of office. And I think that is a, a tack that we need to start using against every single member of the elected politicians that are ignoring us from the L.A. Board uh, of supervisors all the way up to the state representatives and the state senator and the state attorney general and the governor and then the all of our elected officials Corey's every single to everybody every single one of them has been violating the oath of office because the, when they swear the oath of office they swear to protect and defend the constitution that doesn't mean their rights they're protecting they are protecting your rights. Your rights are what matter. And when they don't protect your rights, they violate. They violated their oath of office. And there are um, there are jail time. There's uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fines that are attributed to violation of oath of office. And that's something that we need to start doing. All right. So I wanted to get back to your kids who um, were. What happened that led you to um, be charged with this uh, 
criminal charge. I mean, the, the biggest issue is that I went through so many different people trying to file complaints about what's going on. I mean, just going, I'm going to circle back a little bit to the constitutional violations. I mean, the kids are removed June 2nd, sorry, June 8, 2021 on a protective custody warrant. And it's an ex party setting. What is a protective uh, custody warrant? Um, that's just a way for a social worker to go ahead and file a report um, without notice um, on an ex party hearing, which would be without you there, without any. You're actually you are supposed to be noticed of this. Um, but, but but it's also not actually a warrant. It's called a warrant, but it doesn't meet the level of uh, evidence of a warrant. It's not clear and convincing evidence. It's preponderance. So it's called a warrant, but it's not. It's actually just an order. So um, that happened with me on June 2nd, to, June, sorry, June 8th, 2021. <laughs> and so, I mean, if you think about it, what we're in um, about the end of August 2022. Right. For the first time, my appeal my opening brief isn't going to be done till next month. So we have about a whole year and a month that's already gone by to even go back to what was done within a day. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted um, the time, though, that you um, that the kids called you because I remember they they called you from um, your mom's house mm -hmm. and called you to come get them. And so, well, they, they were already talking about running away. That's and what I so wanted to get more into. What happened they with were, that? My children were already talking about running away. Um, so I was very panicked. I was very frustrated because I've already gone through f at least four different police departments. Um, I would try to do an appeal, but it's, it was too early at that point uh, because you have to go through the the dis or sorry not dis yeah the disposition mm -hmm. hearing before oh, yeah. you can even file your first <laughs> appeal um i went through the supervisors i went through everybody i had no other choice which is what i told the police officers right. i had no other reasonable process than to do this last final step because they were calling for you yes and and what i mean so you go there and you you retrieve them from their grandmother's home correct and you bring them where to my home <laughs> which is where they live, where they reside, where they should have been in the first place. Um, and your home, how far away was that? Um, I want to say it's about a 10 minute drive at the most. We're going between um, Whittier, California to um, Pasadena, California, uh, just to kind of shorthand the, the city locations. Um, so it wasn't very far. Um, and not only that, I told my mom, call the police. I want to speak with them. Right. I have documents I want to present. Because you're afraid at this point that your kids are going to do something that is really going to be dangerous yes. and get them in trouble or well, I mean, more, worse. more specifically, because my son was already held in a suicide watch as a result, trying to run into oncoming traffic. So there were high end risks that were involved with this. It wasn't just, oh, my kids are going to go out and just pack a bag and hide around the corner. No, they were making suicidal threats. Right. Um, this is a, it was a lead up. Yes. Yeah. So it wasn't just that's the first thing that my mind did. I right. went through a number of steps before I and I told the officer as well, um, the one, you know, the one in the video who just mm -hmm. tried to open the door um, that right. was the knocked before trying to pull, drag me mm -hmm. out of the home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so with that one, he, when he arrested me, he came to the car and he said, I just want to let you know, I was the officer that you're speaking with and that the only reason you're being arrested right now is because you didn't follow the proper process. And that proper process being <laughs> that I didn't go to the police department first. Yet you did all these other times and they didn't do anything. More specifically, I went to the Whittier Police Department first and they refused to look at my documentation. Then they refused to go ahead and answer back the email that I titled victim's impact statement about how I wanted to go ahead and pursue criminal charges against the social workers for child abduction. So the exact same charge that I wanted the Whittier Police Department to look into is what they arrested me with instead. I want to get to what happened with your kids um, after this. So they're taken what I mean, they're in your home. And now what happens? Well, from what my mother told me, Justine, my youngest daughter, mm -hmm. she was five years old at the time. She actually hid inside of the house. She didn't want to be found. Um, she, my mom was a little bit worried because she didn't know where she was. Justine hid because she did not want to leave. All the children were saying they don't want to leave. They want to stay here with mommy. I don't want to go. So what happens next? Um, 
criminal court is what followed right afterwards. Where are the kids taken, though, during all this time? I went back but, to my mom. Okay, so at least they went back to your mom. Yes. That's better than what would have happened if you did not have your mom there, because if you didn't have your mom there, they would have been taken into foster care. That's correct. Well, Joshua, he was in foster care. He just went back to my mom's temporarily, then back to the foster mom who had him at the time. Um, so that's another story where the social worker, Joseph Santoyo, tried to conceal my child from me um, after being discharged from um, from the hospital that he was in after the psychiatric hold. Yeah, that's uh, another situation which we're going to get into, yeah. in, you know. In... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. So um, now now that you're arrested, what happens after they have you arrested? Well, um, I was held in the Whittier Detention Office, and what it shows the criminal records is that the officers also lied um, by stating that my mother was trying to bail me out when she was not trying to do that. And because she also stated that it was not necessary um, to get a restraint, a criminal restraining order against me. So because they added in that extra lie about my mother trying to bail me out, which at no point she ever did, they raised the bail so I couldn't leave. Um, I, I was still able to leave. Um, Why I, did they decide not to uh, press charges ultimately? Oh, as far no, as uh, they, they did press charges. Yes. So... <laughs> But why did they they let you leave, though, on bail? So On bail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was left on bail, yeah. um, and then that one went into the criminal court. And as of this last hearing that we just had this past yeah. Monday, it's now changed from a felony offense to a misdemeanor being ran through a pretrial again. Right. Um, so here you are. You know, I mean, what did they want you to do? What happens? Um, I have a situation, too, that I wanted to talk about, but I have to be very careful because I'm dealing with both an open DCFS case and a closed one. And, of course, my daughter, Janie, is the closed one. But what happened in um, a case with myself is that I saw a bruise on a boy who I love. And so he had a bruise right here. And I decided that, I mean, he was getting bruises all over the place all the time. So I decided to take a, a video of that, a picture video. So anyway, I do that. The social worker's right here going, Susan, you can't do that. You can't do that. So he's going like this to block that. And in that time, we touched like, like that. That was it. I'm still taking the video. Um, the visits obviously canceled after that. Then um, they have to take um, this boy I love for a forensic exam, to which point they find bruises all over his body. Besides the one on the arm. Besides the one on the arm, okay? In the forensic exam, it says that they can't determine whether or not it's self-inflicted or child abuse. And you may remember from the past show that self-inflicted doesn't mean anything at all. Kids can self-inflict all the time, and it is okay with the judge. It's okay with the Children's Law Center. Um, everything's just okay if they self-inflict. Nonetheless, they couldn't tell whether it was self-inflicted or actual child abuse. So after this happens, some uh, months go by, and I get charged with assault and battery. Just battery. Oh, no, I think it was assault and battery? Just oh, battery. Okay. Just battery. Um, and so I have to go to criminal court for this charge against me um, because the social worker and my hand touched during the time that I took Battery the is listed as unwanted touching. Assault is un unwanted uh, strike. Yes. So um, this is how I can relate to Misa and her story because, um, you know, what they try to do is they want to get something on you so that you have a record now so they can they can pump up their story about you're crazy it's because a, it's they don't a, have any evidence they, they want to check box right so you know, and that box is criminal record check right because they didn't have one it doesn't need to say anything or mean anything it battery is the lowest of the low of all criminal well, assaults um i just want to touch on that one mm -hmm. it just depends on which parent you are so for example right. in my case right. it lists um different arrests that i've had um nothing mm -hmm. that was actually ever prosecuted um there was just misinformation however with the father of my children the social workers prompted or agreed that the father of the children should have unsupervised visitations. That's right. But on his criminal report shows no hits. 
even though he has an arrest for stabbing, attempting to stab someone on school with a screwdriver, even though he has attempted murder against another woman, but no clear record. And his <laughs> his parental rights were terminated in 2016 in family court. So DCFS, because they are that stupid too, actually bring him back in to be on their side but only because they stated that he was residing in the home if that box was never checked then he would have never been in this case to begin with but because they stated that he was residing in the home they made a mistake more no, mistake no, what, what, it, it, and you know what i said if it was a mistake mm -hmm. can he correct it nope we're not going to talk about that now's not the time to talk about right. it they do that a lot now yeah. is not the time to talk about it there's never the time to talk about it okay well no 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 after the judge yeah. grants the orders we can talk about it by stating that the judge already issued orders on this <laughs> exactly so yeah. yes yes nothing so um all right so <laughs> Now, after all of this, um, you end up in with a criminal charge against you and you alleged. end up, alleged, right, right. And you end up in court. And I guess what we're going to do is we're going to break for here and okay. we're going to come back with you on our next show. We're going to talk about what happened, everything that happened inside of the courtroom. And we happen to have been there too. So we can thank you so much for that. Yes. Yes. We're all sticking together on this. Um, we're going to town on DCFS uh, Los Angeles. But um, also, how can people hear more about your story? Um, so like I had mentioned before in the beginning, I started um, a Facebook page for victims of domestic violence. Uh, right now, I, I'm just using Facebook as a platform, and it's kind of more just like a journal. Um, I've been talking about different instances that are going on with my own life and other people who've been able to relate. Um, so on that one, it's facebook.com and forward slash thinkmisa, T-H-I-N-K-M-I-S-S-A. -S -S Thank you for joining us on The Schofield Truth. If you want to hear more about our show and our story, you can always go to thescofieldtruth.com.